Okay, good morning, everyone. I'd like to start on time. Uh, this session is UHD Beyond the Hype. If that's not what you intended to go to, then please go somewhere else. Uh, you see that I'm wearing a microphone in addition to using the one on the rostrum. I am recording what I'm saying, and it will be posted on my website, shubincafe.com, and on YouTube. Uh, but there's a backlog of presentations. I had a huge number of presentations this fall, so it probably won't be until late December. So let's start with something fairly recent. If you go over to, I think, the last aisle, uh, the SRI booth, they're showing Sarnoff test patterns, and there's a nice gentleman there by the name of Norm Hurst. This is the box that his new TV came in, and it's from Sony. Uh, it says it's a 4K Ultra HD TV, and it says it's four times clearer. That's down at the bottom left of the uh, picture. It also says upscale everything you watch, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The idea of higher resolution is not a new one. This is from the 1928 Consumer Electronics Show in Germany, the Internationale Funkausstellung, and uh, you see a 30-line television picture on the left and a 96-line picture on the right, and so just as the people promoting 4K today are doing, they say, that's a terrible picture on the left, you can't really make anything out, and that's a wonderful picture on the right, and therefore you should go to our ultra-high definition 96 lines. Um, but there's just one problem. There was hype back even then. This is what an actual off-screen 30-line picture looked like and it's considerably better looking than the one on the left. Now you can say, well, the one on the left is bigger, so I've made them smaller. Uh, no matter how you look at it, the actual picture was considerably better than the one that was being used in the hype to say you have to go to our new system. No question the 96 line looks better than the 30, but the 30 doesn't look all that bad. Another caution, I cannot properly show you here most of the things that I'm going to be talking about. I can't show you resolution on this projector, can't show you higher frame rate, can't show you higher dynamic range, can't show you a wider color gamut, although I'll show you something interesting about that. Uh, another thing is that the source material matters considerably. So if you go around to many HD exhibits, you'll see some still life of flowers or um, and ocelot that's sitting waiting to pounce but not moving because still pictures um, can look better than moving pictures and I'll show you some of that. And viewing conditions matter even at home. The screen size, the distance, the type of display, the environment, and finally the big problem is it is still 2014. Now what do I mean by that? Perception is learned. So there have been experiments where they'll raise kittens from birth and prevent them from seeing certain stimuli like vertical lines and they'll expose them only to horizontal lines. And then they'll have this kind of apparatus where they tempt the kitten to walk across something that's a pane of clear glass that has lines painted on it but they're the kind of lines that the kitten has not been exposed to. The kitten can't see it so it won't walk across the glass because it will think that there's a gap there the lines moving in the other direction, it will walk across. And it's not just kittens, same kind of thing with people. Um, this was the first paid movie theater, the Lumiere Cinematographe in Paris in 1895, and they just showed movies like uh, people leaving the factory, someone on a bicycle. This particular movie was one called The Arrival of the Train at the Station of La Ciotat, and um, here's somebody reporting on that, and he says, one of my neighbors was so much captivated that she sprang to her feet and waited until the car disappeared before she sat down again. And some people have uh, used that to say that she was scared of the train. Well, she was watching something that was black and white, silent. Um, the train was not even heading towards the camera, and yet it had this big effect on her. Or here's another example. In... Uh, the 19th century, Thomas Edison came up with the phonograph and it was cylinder based. And then a few years later, Emil Berliner came up with the disc based phonograph. And I won't go too much into the details, but eventually the disc took over from the cylinder. And so Edison decided he had to come out with his own discs and he did, but he needed to say that his discs were better than anyone else's discs. 
So he came up with these things called tone tests. And in a small area, people would be blindfolded and asked to tell the difference between a record. Now, this is a 78 RPM um, hard record or a live singer. And people would say, oh, we couldn't tell the difference. Or they'd even do it in some very large hall. Here was a report in the Pittsburgh Post of a thing in a concert hall, and the reporter saying, did not seem difficult to determine in the dark when the singer sang and when she did not. Ryder himself was pretty sure about it until the lights were turned on again and it was discovered that the singer was not on the stage at all and that the new Edison alone had been heard. Now today we think, that's ridiculous. Who can't tell the difference between a live singer and a 78 RPM recording? But people were not that accustomed to recordings in those days. So perception is learned. Today we have learned hi-fi sound perception. There is also one little additional thing. The woman at the right, uh, Anna Case, was one of the sopranos that Edison used for his tone testing. And she revealed in 1972, before her death, that she had trained herself to sound like a phonograph recording of herself. So, you're going to see a lot of things on the show floor here. You saw on that box, um, 4K, UHD, ultra high definition. What is 4K? As far as the European Broadcasting Union is concerned, if you use a capital K, it only means four degrees above absolute zero. A temperature at which liquid hel helium uh, can be liquid. But other people use it to mean 4,096 horizontal pixels by 3,072 vertically, or 4,096 by 2048 vertically, or 4,096 by 2160 vertically. 2160 is twice HD's 1080. Or it could be just 3840 by 2160, 3840 being twice HD's 1920. Uh, which is more properly referred to as quad HD. You saw that thing on the Sony box saying four times clearer. Uh, well, there's four times as many pixels. We'll discuss whether it's clearer or not later. And then there's this UHD. Now, UHD was originally a term that was developed by NHK, the Japan Broadcasting Corporation, um, for their system that today we refer to as 8K. That's 7680 by uh, 4320 but it was adopted by the Consumer Electronics Association in the United States because they were a little concerned about lawsuits. If you bought a TV that said 4K and it was delivering only 3840, somebody might say, aha, it's not 4K. So they decided to call it ultra high definition. But as far as standards groups are concerned, ultra high definition can also refer to higher frame rate higher dynamic range, which is the range from the brightest to the darkest thing in the picture, or higher contrast, uh, wider color gamut, and immersive sound. And I'll talk a little bit about all those things. And then we have a question of what a 4K camera is, and I'll tell you much more about that. Uh, but is a single color-filtered 4K sensor actually 4K? And why do some 4K cameras have 8 million pixels in them, or 8 million photo sites, and some have 20 million photo sites. So first, let's start talking about resolution versus height. We made a change from vertical to horizontal. When we started talking HD, we went from 480 lines of standard definition to 720 lines or 1080 lines in HD. And for ultra HD, it's 2160 lines. But that's not 4K. There's no way that 2160 is anything like 4K. So to make it more impressive, they simply rotated the axis and ultra high definition is measuring horizontally. And it still might not quite get up to 4K, but it gets closer. Also, when people talk about 4K, they are talking only about static spatial uncompressed resolution. So static means that nothing is moving. The camera is not moving, nothing in the picture is moving. Spatial means it's only resolution across the picture. And uncompressed means no one has done anything to the uh, signal that might take away resolution. It's not dynamic resolution. Dynamic resolution is spatial resolution in moving pictures. It's not color resolution. Colors might have less resolution. And it's also not sharpness. Sharpness is definitely not resolution. And I'll explain that in a moment. So SIMT, the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, they have a booth over here. They are our main standards organization. Um, what 
does SIMTI stand for again? It's society, the P is picture, the T is television, the E is engineers, but the M stands for motion. So here's a picture that you might see on television or a cinema screen. Um, is there any 4K there? No, because it's all blurry, it's moving. Um, here's another picture, and this one's a lot sharper. I'm gonna give you a homework assignment. This is a still from a, an artwork that's called Street that was made by an artist named James Nairs, and he took a vision research high frame rate camera and he stuck it out the side window of a car that went through Manhattan streets at 30 miles an hour. So that picture is not taken from a tripod, that's taken from a car that's moving at 30 miles an hour. And some of it is out of focus. Uh, part of that is no one was really looking at it, but for what's in focus, it's tremendously sharper than what you just saw. There is again what you just saw, and here is what you're seeing, much, much sharper. That's just an HD picture. The reason that it's sharper is because it's a higher frame rate. A higher frame rate means a shorter exposure time. A shorter exposure time means the images are going to be sharper. So I recommend you go on the internet, you can look at a, a couple of minutes of this artwork, uh, and I made a uh, URL for you that's very easy. It's bit.ly slash nares, but the N has to be a capital N. So bit.ly slash N-A-R-E-S with a capital N. So here's a little bit more about dynamic resolution versus static resolution. If you look at the tracks and the ties in these images, they're absolutely identical resolution. It could be standard definition, could be high definition, could be 4K, doesn't matter, but they're exactly the same resolution. But if you look at the locomotive, obviously there's tremendously different resolution there. And that's again because the locomotive is moving. And that's the difference between 50 frames per second at the top and 300 frames per second at the bottom. So here's a common camera and lens combination. Uh, it's a long lens of the sort you would use in sports or shooting a concert or an award show or something. It's got a very, very standardized mount. We refer to it as a B4 mount, but the mount was standardized by the Broadcast Technology Association as S1005A. It's then got a dichroic prism that splits the uh, image into its three color components, and then it's got three sensors, in this case, three HD sensors. So let's say you wanna make an ultra high definition camera, and let's say your current camera has a resolution of two. I'm not talking about 2K, just two. Two pixels across, two pixels down. And you wanna make it four. So what's one way to go about it? Well, just make everything bigger. And you can do that. You can, in fact, make a 4K camera exactly the same as an HD camera with three sensors and a big prism and so on. And at the right, I'm showing you one of those that was actually built. It was built by Lockheed Martin. Uh, there was a paper about it in the SIMPTI journal in 2001. And you can see it's a very, very large camera. Now, why is it so large? Well, there in the middle, I'm showing you the size of the image sensors. They're like this. They're bigger than an IMAX film frame and much bigger than 35 millimeter film frames, which you can see at the bottom there. But if you look at the chart at the right, you can see that green line is what this camera did and the uh, solid black line is um, what film stock does. And so the, the transfer is actually pretty close. So it was actually a, an excellent camera but Lockheed Martin just made it as a demonstration. They never went into the cinema camera business. So what's the alternative? Well, one alternative is to use a single sensor and put on-chip color filtering. Sometimes it's called a Bayer filter, which is named after a researcher at uh, Kodak who came up with the particular pattern. And if you go out on the show floor here, you'll see Aja's booth and they're showing this camera. It's called the Scion and they call it a 4K camera. And this is from their brochure, the thing on the right. And I apologize for the little dirt on either side. That's not their fault, that's my fault in the scanning. But what I wanted to show you from their brochure is it says it has an optical low pass filter, which is an important thing. It prevents you from getting aliases. Um, and it says it reduces unwanted moiré effects and retains vital image detail. But my question is, how do you do that when you're using a Bayer filter. 
because if you look at the left, you're seeing what the Bayer pattern looks like on the total sensor. But if you look at the top right, you're seeing what it is for the three different colors. The red is just 2K because every other photosite is not red. The blue is just 2K because every other photosite is not blue. The green is a little different. It has twice as many as either the red or the blue, but it doesn't have four times as many. Remember that Sony box saying four times clearer. Um, so if you do optical filtering that's appropriate for the green, it's going to be wrong for the red or the blue. And if you do optical filtering that's appropriate for the red or the blue, it's going to be wrong for the green. There's just no two ways about it. If you have one sensor, you cannot properly optically filter it. Um, for something like a Bayer pattern. And so you get something like this statement at the bottom right from Peter Senton, who's a, a brilliant camera designer. Uh, and he says, if the Dalsa and Red One, which were 4K cameras at the time, are 4K, then the Panavision Genesis and the Sony F23, which were really just HD cameras, are 6K because of the number of photosites. Now, also, if you don't do filtering, you get these color filter artifacts. Here's a picture of a fence, and I've blown it up tremendously so you can see the individual uh, color filter artifacts. That's obviously terrible, and obviously no camera, still cameras, um, movie cameras aren't doing this. So what they're doing is they're filtering to get rid of these artifacts. Well, that's fine, but when you filter something, you remove. So when you filter the original image, you are removing resolution when you're removing these color artifacts. Um, we also have lens issues. Let's say you want to use a lens that worked on your original camera. Well, remember the original camera was just two by two. It's the center stuff. The red circle that I've shown would be a lens that would be perfectly appropriate for that camera, but it's no longer appropriate for this larger sensor. And so people make adapters so you can use your two-thirds inch format lenses. Uh, but those adapters, if they're 100% perfect, lose 2.6 stops of sensitivity. That's the equivalent of 600%, which is the equivalent of six times more light. That's fairly significant, I would say. So the issue of using a long-range zoom for a 4K camera, very, very difficult. On the left is a typical long-range zoom. At the right is one of those adapters. And this adapter says that it also compensates for different color depths. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but Canon just introduced a few weeks ago the longest range zoom that exists for a Super 35 um, imager, and it's 20 to 1. And the lenses I've been showing you are 99 to 1 or 101 to 1 or 100 to 1, something like that. So here's that color depth thing. Remember I told you that the B4 mount is extremely standardized. So the lens is way off to the left side. Um, then we have the prism block. But behind the prism block, the camera manufacturers and the lens manufacturers got together and they said, sorry, but we just can't make the three colors land in exactly the same place. But that's not a problem if you're using three different sensors. So we'll make the green land in one plane. We'll make the blue land five microns behind that. We'll make the red land 10 microns behind that. No problem. We compensate for that when we build the camera. But when we have a single um, sensor, we can't make the different colors land at different depths. And so we have that adapter that says it's going to compensate for the different depths. Well, here's a typical zoom lens. The uh, group of elements at the far left is for focusing the image. The group that's next to that is called the variator. That's for zooming the image or magnifying it. The next group is called the compensator. That's for maintaining focus while you zoom. But the final bit is called the relay, and that's simply for making the picture show up on the sensor where it's supposed to be. And notice that there's seven pieces of glass to do that. So now you're going to take one of these adapters, and even if it's a, an optically magnificent adapter, you're adding maybe another seven pieces of glass to your lens, which introduces more reflections, it introduces more side aberrations, uh, more chromatic aberration, all kinds of stuff that you don't want, plus that 2.6 stops or 600% light loss. So fairly significant. So what are alternatives? Well, one would be instead of making the sensor bigger, 
I make the photosites smaller. So I go from two to four by subdividing each photosite. Um, but now I'm only getting a quarter of the photons per site. So I have a quarter of the uh, contrast capability, and it's actually worse than that because there's some transistors in there that take up room, and if I make the site smaller, then the t transistors take up more room. Now, is it possible to get around those difficulties with processing? Yes, I could do processing of the overall image, gather my contrast information from that, apply it to the individual uh, photo sites. It can be done. It isn't being done. I do not know of a single camera manufacturer who's doing that yet. It's also harder to make this chip because now everything is a quarter of the size. It's very difficult. And no such two-thirds inch format camera exists today. So that alternative, not so good. So then we have alternative number two, and this one you can see out on the show floor at Hitachi's booth. It's the Hitachi SK UHD 4000. It uses ordinary high definition sensors but it has four of them instead of three. There's two green ones, and the green ones are offset by one half pixel diagonally, and so they are creating that smaller pixel size that I just showed you without your having to fabricate it. Now, it's difficult to do the optical splitting for it, but they're doing it, and so they first showed this at the International Broadcasting Convention in Amsterdam in September, and to me, the most interesting thing is that blue label at the right, so I'll blow that up. Um, that's Gearhouse Broadcast. Gearhouse Broadcast is a mobile production company, and they were so excited about the ability to use their existing long-range zoom lenses on a 4K camera that they bought 50 of them at IBC. Um, so very, very significant to be able to get around that lens problem, supposedly. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Let me introduce the idea of contrast. Now, I've got resolution increasing from left to right, and I've got contrast increasing from bottom to top. So the resolution at the top right corner is exactly the same as the resolution at the bottom right corner. But you probably can't see anything there. Now, does everybody see kind of a curve at the bottom there? Okay, I hear somebody saying, yep. Um, it certainly looks to you like there's a curve, but there is no curve. The curve is being introduced by your visual system. And if you want to, you can walk up and down the aisle here and you'll see the bottom of the curve move depending on how close to the image you are. So this is a contrast sensitivity function. And the human sensation of sharpness is based on a combination of resolution and contrast. So let's use those exact same axes now, but show you a different curve. Contrast is still increasing from bottom to top. Resolution is still increasing from left to right, but now I'm showing you something called a modulation transfer function. That's, in this case, modulation is contrast, going from white to black or black to white. Uh, transfer is getting it through the system, and function is, well, how well does it do? And the system could be a whole camera with lens, sensor, uh, everything. It could be from the scene to what you see at home. Um, it could be a piece of wire, it could be anything. And all of those systems tend to have a curve that has this kind of basic shape. It may not be exactly this shape, but it'll, there'll be a very high level of the curve where there's no resolution, at zero resolution, and there'll be a much lower level of the curve as the resolution gets higher. So the left part of the curve is called the shoulder, and the bottom part of the curve is called the toe. Now, sharpness, anything that ends in ness, brightness, loudness, sharpness, those are all psychophysical functions. Those are things that happen only in your brain. Um, so sharpness is proportional either to the square of the area under this curve, that's the RCA uh, position that Otto Shade came up with and was published in the Simpty Journal, uh, or it's proportional to just the area. That's the Ari and Zeiss position. But one way or the other, the area under that curve is what's significant, not how far it goes to the right. So Sony, when they came out with HD cam, um, had a compromise that worked rather well. They had a hard time. How are we going to record all of this stuff that's in HD, 1920 by 1080? They said, ah, we won't. We'll just record 1440 by 1080. So they cut off a third of the resolution, going from uh, 1920 to uh, 144, sorry, a quarter of the resolution. 
um, big loss of resolution, but almost no loss of sharpness, because look at the size of the toe where they cut it off. There's not much area under the curve. So can you see the difference between HD cam, which cuts it off, and HD cam SR, which doesn't? Yeah, you can see it if you get really up close and you see a picture that has enough detail, but it's not something the average viewer is really reacting to because you're not messing with the sharpness. You're only messing with the resolution. And then Panasonic did the same thing with DVC Pro HD, ABC Intra 50, ABC HD, which Sony uses in NX cam. They all have the same kind of compromise. So a lot of people say, oh, let's use 4K for 2K production. In other words, for HD, use a 4K camera for HD. And there are some benefits for that because there, here's one way that you can extend the MTF shoulder. Now you have to filter a digital system that does sampling or you'll get terrible aliases. And the basic filter is called a sine X over X filter or a sync function. So here is a chart of the sync function. And the numbers at the bottom are totally arbitrary. They don't mean anything. They're just going from um, zero samples up to the highest number of samples. And at the left, I've put a little contrast wedge so you can see what contrast looks like. Well, if you shoot with an HD camera and what's number 11 on this chart is 1080 lines, then the contrast at 1080 lines is zero. Zero is all gray. Means you're not really getting HD resolution out of your HD camera. If you shoot with a 4K camera and number 11 is 2160 lines, well then the contrast at 1080 lines is 64%. And as you can see on the left, there's a big difference between 64% and zero. So it is good to go to higher resolution um, sensors. And so here's comparing two cameras that are doing exactly the same thing, but with slightly different resolution in their sensors. This is a Canon EOS 10D, an old single lens reflex digital camera they had, and an EOS 20D. And the 20D has 14% uh, linear increase in sensors over the um, 10D. And you can see from the blue line that it has more of a shoulder to the curve than the 10D does, and here's what it looks like. If we take pictures from those, you, you don't necessarily, you can't read these, uh, they're too far away, they're too small, but I think everyone in the room can see that the one on the right looks sharper than the one on the left, and that's just a 14% increase. So if you go to twice as much, 100% increase, you'll get significant sharpness. So shooting 4K has certain benefits for HD output you can reframe in post. Um, a lot of people are saying, oh, I'll shoot 4K and then I've got four times the image area to move around in in post and pick stuff up in. You can do image stabilization in post. You can do easier filtering because there's oversampling. If you're shooting 3D, you can actually shoot 3D with a single lens. Um, and you can get increased sharpness based on what I just told you somewhat because there's still a problem and that's the lens. If you're using an HD lens, then that HD lens has very good performance up to where I put HD here. This is a hypothetical MTF curve for a lens. So looks like you're getting about 90% contrast at HD resolution. But on this particular hypothetical curve, you're getting something like 40% contrast at 4K resolution. So if you reframe in post, then you're using the area between where it says HD and where it says 4K. So you're not getting the advantage of that 100% to 90% area, you're getting the area that goes from 90% down to 40%. And if you lose contrast, you lose sharpness. So that's a problem even with the Hitachi camera that you can see on the show floor. So here's alternative number three. Grass Valley's here, you can discuss it with them. They have a 4K camera. And the 4K camera, to tell the truth, is actually just a regular HD camera. It's got HD sensors, it's got an HD prism, it uses HD lenses, everything is HD until you get to the output. And then they've done a very good job of upconversion. So they're upconverting from HD to 4K. But what's their advantage? Well, because they're starting with everything matched, the lens is matched to the uh, optical filtering, which is matched to the sensors, everything is perfectly filtered. So the up conversion works better than it works in potentially a 4K camera, 
where you have to have the compromises of the Bayer filtering and defiltering, or you have to deal with the um, sensors not matching what the lens does or something like that. So it may seem like they're cheating at first, but they're cheating with some smarts. Um, that's, there's method to their madness, as they would say. Now, here's another thing to consider, depth of field. Neither of those two pictures is correct or incorrect. There are times when you might want to separate the foreground from the background. There are times when you might want everything to be in focus. If you're shooting sports or news, you probably want everything to be in focus. If you're shooting dramatic programming and there's somebody who's very forlorn and lonely, then you might want the background to be out of focus. Um, but all things being equal, which of course they never are, um, a larger sensor has less depth of field, so the image on the left, than a smaller sensor, the image on the right. So if you go to something like the RED camera, which is on the show floor, uh, you'll see it's wonderful for doing dramatic programming because it gives you that narrow depth of field, not necessarily so good for doing sports or news. So this was the keynote at the Society for Information Displays Display Week uh, 2014, and it's from a researcher at Sony. And he came up with this pentagram uh, that shows, or pentagon, that shows um, spatial resolution, temporal resolution, which is frame rate, quantization, which is number of bits, uh, contrast, which is dynamic range, and color gamut. And he didn't, but he might have added things about sound, so you could have sound quality going from AM to FM to CD to super CD, and you could have the field of the sound going from mono to stereo to 5.1 to immersive sound. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with his slide or what I've added to it, except for the idea that these tick marks are um, equidistant and that going from one tick mark to another is the same as going from another tick mark to another. So why do we even think about higher spatial resolution? Well, it started with movie theaters. Ari uh, came out with it when they came out with a 6K uh, scanner for scanning film. And so they came up with this diagram of a movie theater and they're showing that in this particular movie theater, even if you're sitting in the very last row, you can see 3K resolution, which is more than HD. And if you're sitting two-thirds of the way back, you can see 4K resolution. And if you're sitting one-third of the way back, you can see 8K resolution. So, boy, you really need higher resolution in a movie theater. Except that these are the highest box office grosses of movies in the year 2013, and only two of them were shot in what is even called a 4K camera. That's number eight, The Hobbit, and number 10, uh, Oz the Great and Powerful. Those were both shot with red epic cameras. Everything else was either shot on film or animated or shot with the Ari Alexa. Now, the Ari Alexa, excellent camera, uh, wonderful dynamic range, everything put together very, very nicely, but it's less than 3K resolution. So the company that came up with that chart I just showed you in the movie theater, they are making a lot of money selling cameras for shooting movies that are less than 3K. And people love the movies. So here's a movie, Spider-Man, and uh, I'm not sure whether this was uh, supposedly released in 4K or not. Pete Lude sent this to me, and the reason he sent it is there's no 4K information in the computer graphics. Almost no one is doing any computer graphics in 4K. And most blockbuster movies these days, even non-blockbuster movies, have a lot of computer graphics in them. So if the computer graphics aren't 4K, then the movie is not 4K. There's also limits to visual acuity. Here's the view of 4K from 40,000 feet. Um, and the little tiny dots that you can see there, those are shrubs that are larger than TVs. So 4K from 40,000 feet looks exactly the same as standard definition from 40,000 feet. You can't even see that there's a TV set down there. So here is a 4K display at Ericsson's booth at NAB this year, shot by Pete Putman. And the most common thing that you hear people saying at 4K displays is, oh, is that 4K? because it's not something that you can tell right away. There are a bunch of booths here on the show floor you can go to. They're showing 4K monitors, and 
I defy you at any one of them to just, oh yeah, that's 4K, for sure. You know, they might have signs all over it saying, this is 4K, you're still going to go, hmm. And the converse is also true. I was doing a show last week, I think it was, and I had a Sony OLED monitor, which has wonderful contrast, just an HD monitor, though, and a director was sitting next to me, and he said, that's a 4K monitor, right? No, it's just an HD monitor, but it had the contrast, and so he was getting the sharpness from it. Also, whatever the home viewing distance is, and home viewing distance, there is no single home viewing distance, because if you're relaxed, you lean back. If you're excited, you lean forward, and that can be about a yard of difference. That aqua line that you're seeing is a yardstick. Whatever it is, people buy TVs much closer. They go to Best Buy or whatever, and they stand two feet away from the screen. Um, so here is an exhibit that was at the NAB show this year. It was NHK's of 8K, and notice the footprints on the floor. That's where they want you to stand so you can appreciate the resolution. Well, if you put a living room couch there, your knees would bang up against that cabinet. So European Broadcasting Union did viewing tests, and they revealed them at the Hollywood Post Alliance tech retreat last year. Uh, the tests were done with a 56-inch screen. They had six different sequences. They did everything right according to how you're supposed to test this stuff. And the first interesting thing, a lot of people say, oh, you can't see 4K because we don't have enough visual acuity. Well, that's not true. Uh, what I'm showing on the left is there is absolutely a statistically significant improvement going from HD to 4K, and it doesn't matter what kind of HD, 720p, 1080i, or even 1080p. But how much of an improvement is it? The red line is if you're sitting at a normal TV viewing distance, 2.7 meters or about 9 feet from the TV. You're getting about a third of a grade of improvement, maybe a little less than a third of a grade. If you sit at one and a half times the picture height, which for a 56-inch screen is 40 inches away, so if you're sitting a yard and four inches away from your TV screen, um, then you get a little more improvement, but even that is just half a grade of improvement. So definitely a statistically significant improvement, but not a very big one, and you need eight times the data rate to do that. Now, I mentioned like the Sony box that says it's four times clearer because it has four times the pixels. 4K, definitely four times the pixels of HD, but you're also going either from interlace 1080i to progressive, or you're going from 720p, which is just one megapixel, up to 4K, which is eight megapixels, uh, because 4K does not have interlace. So it's eight times the data rate, either pre-compression or post-compression. Compression, you can do a lot better. Um, by the way, this also sort of applies to sound. So I participated in some focus groups in the early 1970s, and we showed them stereo sound for television for the first time, and people said, wow, it made the picture bigger. People would say, oh, you know, you, you showed a bigger TV this time than you did last time. Um, well, here are some tests that were done at IBC in 2013 by Penguin Engineering Bureau in Germany, uh, and then they showed the results this year, and the question was, which sounds more immersive to you? And in everything they did, the more immersive the sound was, in other words, the more channels there were, the more immersive it sounded to the viewers. But there is a difference. So look at the bottom. That's going from one-dimensional sound, which is stereo, to two-dimensional, and the blue is a tremendous number of people say, oh, it's more immersive in uh, two dimensions. That's uh, surround sound. And then the next is going from one-dimensional to three-dimensional, and even more people say, oh, yeah, I feel more immersive. But when they went from two-dimensional, something like 5.1, to three-dimensional, where there's overhead sound and underneath sound, more people liked it still, but it's not as much as the others. So there's even an asymptote in sound. You can get to a point where, okay, we've given you a tremendous amount. If we give you more, maybe you're not really going to appreciate that. Now, Black Magic is one of the exhibitors that you'll um, see on the show floor here. And they have some cameras. And the cameras are listed as Ultra HD cameras. And you'll see that they say they deliver 12G SDI, um, which is true. That's how much SDI you need to get 4K at 60 frames per second out of a camera. 
And then they're showing that they have some switchers. They have production switchers and they have routing switchers. Unfortunately, their Ultra HD inputs are only 6G SDI. So you cannot connect the Blackmagic camera to the Blackmagic switcher and expect to get what the camera is putting out. That's one company. So quick recap on shooting 4K. The good news, down conversion to HD, always a great idea. Reframing, stabilizing, and post for HD, yes, but there's this MTF thing, doing 3D on one sensor, yeah, you can do it. Um, Con, currently less sensitive, no long zooms for PL mount lenses, eight times the data you have to deal with, and no connection standard, not even in a single company, Blackmagic Design. So, next question, must you change to 4K? Here's another exhibitor on the show floor here, Utilsat, uh, but this is their booth at NAB, not here, and there's that woman jumping for joy, and why is she jumping for joy? Because they're broadcasting more than 5,000 TV channels, of which 500 are in HD. Hint, the other 4,500 are not UHD. <laughs> and we go back to that TV that Norm Hurst bought, and you can talk to him at the SRI booth. I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you about his TV. And what's the first word on the box? Upscale everything. So it doesn't matter what you transmit. The TV is going to upscale it to 4K. You can transmit HD. You can transmit standard definition. The TV is going to upscale it to 4K. But here are some articles that appeared in CNET, and one of them says, oh, here, there's three things you can do that are more worthwhile than 4K. And the other one says that the push for 4K is actually maybe forcing picture quality trade-offs. So what's going on? Well, I showed you what the EBU released at the HPA Tech Retreat in 2013. This is seven months later at um, the... Uh, International Broadcasting Convention, and this time they're showing higher frame rate. And um, they're showing five different sequences. These are sequences that had high motion. Um, but now, look at the improvement. Every time the frame rate doubles, you're getting a full grade of improvement. Before, you're going to eight times the data rate, and you're getting half a grade or a third a grade of improvement. Here you're doubling the data rate and you're getting a full grade of improvement. So definitely much more bang for the buck from uh, going to higher frame rate. And then Variety comes out and they've got this headline says Dolby's high dynamic range TV delivers a bigger wow than UHD. Well, the UHD that they're referring to is 4K. So what is high dynamic range? Well, here are some pictures that Joe Kane shot. Uh, this is at a ski lift, but obviously not in the skiing season. You can see from this picture, there's clearly a bunch of trees out there, but you don't see much of what's happening inside the ski lift house. So this one, the trees are starting to get overexposed, but you can see who the people are. You can maybe make out some of the people inside the gondola. Uh, but you still really don't get a good idea of what's happening in the dark, so let's go one more. Well, now... You know, you could be in a studio for all you know. You can't see anything outside. There's not a single tree visible. But you have a pretty good idea of who's in the gondola and what's happening up front. So what if we could put all of that into a single picture? So here is a single picture. This was done at uh, Grass Valley Lab. And the light that you're seeing that's aiming right into the lens of the camera, 500-watt light, that's the only light in this picture. Everything is being illuminated by that light that's aimed right into the camera. And notice that you can see, well, with the lights on in here, you can on my screen, I can see every chip of the chip chart, as well as if you look at the bottom right, you can count the coils in the filament of the lamp. So everything is there. Um, this is a 10 million to one contrast ratio, or more than 23 stops but this was shown at NAB in 2008. And it's the Grass Valley Sensium sensor, which is what they use in all their cameras. Have they made a camera yet that can use all of this dynamic range? No. But other people have, using the same chip. So there's a company called Lux Media Plan, a German camera manufacturer, and their HD 1200 uses this camera. And when it's in high dynamic range mode, um, they claim... I think 120 dB of dynamic range. 
So again, back to the MTF curve, if we extend the resolution past HD, then yeah, we're absolutely extending resolution. It's, is it possible to see it? Absolutely, the EBU charts show that it's possible to see it, but we're not adding much area under the curve. And if we're not adding much area under the curve, we're not adding much sharpness. Now, if instead we could raise the curve a little at the far end, we're now adding considerably more sharpness, and that's just by improving the far end resolution, which might be from a better lens or something like that. And if we can move the entire curve up, well, now we're adding tremendously more um, contrast, and therefore we're adding tremendously more area, and therefore tremendously more sharpness. So here is another chart. This is not from the EBU because the EBU asked me not to use their chart, but this is from the uh, Ecole Polytechnique Federale Lausanne, which is the Swiss um, Federal um, Polytechnic Institute in Lausanne, Switzerland. And now they're just showing increase in contrast ratio. So the left side of this curve is 100 nits. That's what our reference monitors are. Somebody who's doing color grading or video uh, operating in a truck. Um, then they have 400, then 1,000, and then 4,000. And uh, again, we're getting like a grade of improvement going from 100 nits up to 400 nits. Well, the green line that I've put down at the bottom there is roughly today's TVs. They run from in the range of about 350 nits up to very close to 1,000 nits. So today's TVs already offer more contrast than what the video shader is using. And if we could simply improve what the video shader has, we can increase the contrast that people are seeing. So then we get to this question of bit depth. Do we need to add more bits if we're adding more contrast? Theoretically, the answer is no. The number of bits simply determines the signal to noise ratio. It has absolutely nothing to do with the uh, overall contrast. But as a practical matter, people don't maintain one half of the least significant bit worth of noise. And so there is contouring that you see if you watch you know, HBO at home, you'll see skies with lines through them that don't exist there, and that gets reduced to uh, half of the contouring for each additional bit that you add. So if you add a couple more bits, then you could consider that to be like four times the contrast ratio. So now I'm taking those three charts, and I've normalized the vertical scale. So they all have the same vertical scale. So on the left, we see going from HD to 4K, tiny bit of improvement. In the middle, we see going from um, standard frame rate to higher frame rate, much more improvement. And at the right, we see going from um, 100 nits uh, reference monitor to the higher contrast monitors and even more improvement. So what gives you the biggest bang for the buck? Well, the left requires eight times the data rate per grade, or uh, 16 times per grade, eight times for the improvement it gives. The middle one gives you two times for a grade of improvement. The one at the right, anything from zero to maybe 0.2 uh, for a grade of improvement. But there is interactivity between these things. So here is a chart that appeared in a paper that came from the Visual Space Perception Laboratory at Berkeley. And the circle, the black circle, is what's visible, what's inside that circle. And uh, what you want to see is just one line. Uh, that's what I put the red oval around. That's not in the original. And then you see a bunch of other lines there. Those are caused by having insufficient temporal resolution. So you're getting motion artifacts. But notice that the lines are not all solidly black. Some of them are fading off to gray. Um, if you increase the dynamic range, then you're making those lines more visible. So going to higher dynamic range actually increases the possibility of motion artifacts. But surprise, surprise, going to higher definition also increases the possibility of motion artifacts. Why? Look at the chart on the left. That's the unaliased screen crossing speed. So uh, how many pixels do you have to traverse to cross the screen? If you have 720p at 120 frames per second, then you can cross the screen in less than 11 seconds and everything will look great. If you have 4K at 24 frames per second, then it takes you almost three minutes to cross the screen. So waiters to the rescue. 
Um, if you go to watch a movie, you will almost invariably see a shot where the camera follows a waiter who has absolutely nothing to do with the plot from one side of a restaurant to the table where the protagonists are. Why? Because if you don't follow that waiter, then you get either unbelievably blurry pictures or unbelievably strobing pictures. But by having the waiter be essentially stationary in the frame, you don't concentrate on the blurriness and the strobing that's behind it. So for cinematography, absolutely you can do this. Hire cinematographers to shoot your dramatic programming, and you don't have any issue with motion artifacts. But if you're shooting live sports, sorry, cinematographers don't shoot that. Okay, now let's get into wider color gamut. Um, no matter what three phosphors you pick, there's going to be a tremendous number of colors that are perceptible that aren't going to come out. So there's a company called Genoa Color Technologies, and they make displays that have more than three phosphors, four colors of phosphors, or five colors of phosphors. And the chart at the upper right shows you that you're getting um, more color out of their stuff than you do out of another. And so there's a demonstration that they did at the HPA Tech Retreat. And on the left monitor, you see this thing that's kind of reddish. And on the right monitor, which is the general monitor, you see something that's more magenta-ish. And if you look at the bottom right of that picture, you can see what the camera is shooting. And you can see that the color the camera is shooting is very closely reproduced by what's on the right monitor. So Genoa technology is great, right? Except what you're watching right now is from three primaries. So caveat emptor, there is hype. This shot, this slide is from the Consumer Electronics Association showing what the TV set manufacturers are doing. Obviously, resolution is what they're pushing. 4K, UHD, that's their big push. They say they're going to hire frame rate. They say they're going to hire dynamic range. They don't even have something to say for that, just HDR, and they put it in the um, oval there. They say they're increasing the bit depth. They say they're increasing the colorimetry, but all that they're pushing right now is that 4K upscale everything you watch. So here's some quick comparisons of 4K, high dynamic range, and high uh, frame rate. The biggest wow factor, certainly the biggest bang for the bit, um, high dynamic range. Um, that's why Variety was all excited. Everyone who sees the Dolby demos says this is tremendously exciting. High frame rate, also something that you can see from across the room. 4K, much, much less. That's why, you know, walk the show floor here, look at everything that's 4K and see whether you decide that it's 4K or that it's significantly different from HD. Freedom from lens issues, high frame rate. It doesn't care what the lens is. High dynamic range, little issue, especially you know if you start adding that relay optics and other seven pieces of glass to introduce reflections, you reduce the contrast. But the worst problem for lenses, 4K, huge problem for lenses. Freedom from motion artifacts, obviously high frame rate, freedom from motion artifacts. But the strange thing is that both high dynamic range and 4K can increase the visibility of motion artifacts. And the likeliness that you're not going to affect current storytelling practices and sensations, well, 4K, because if it's not doing that much to you, then it's not doing that much to you. <laughs> uh, high dynamic range and high frame rate do affect it, but bear in mind that there was also a time, and not so long ago, when great directors said, oh, we should never go to a wider aspect ratio. Uh, Sergei Eisenstein said, I want to have a vertical aspect ratio. Um, there were Jean Renoir and Francois Truffaut both said color is the worst thing that has happened to movie making. Um, there were people who said that sound is terrible for movie making. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's different, but it's a tool and used in the right hands, the tool can be very good. And this is just to show you that it's not ending yet. This is from this year's Consumer Electronics Show, 5K Ultra HD, and we're going to go beyond that. So I will be happy to take any questions, and let me also point out that our session ends officially in about six minutes, but I will stay because there's nobody following us uh, until the last question is answered. So, any questions? All right, so why, and this may be a question you can't answer, but you know, uh, so if 4K isn't the, uh, the ideal path forward for the bang for the buck and, and the impression, why is the CDA going that way and not 
moving more aggressively in dynamic range in February? It's something that has a number on it. And it's the same reason that they changed from using the vertical numbers to using the horizontal numbers. HD, you know, HD sales, uh, obviously everyone needed to replace their TV with something that was either HD or flat panel or something like that. But then when they did, sales started dropping off and TV set sales are not doing well. TV itself may not be doing so well. So they need something to attract the buyer. And as was said of the 16 to 9 aspect ratio before uh, HD came out, it's something you can see even in an ad. Well, 4K is something you can see even in an ad. Oh, what do I have now? I have 1,000 lines. They're offering 4,000 something. I better buy a new TV. Any other questions? Yes? So, sure, uh, the reason for 4K, it's something you can't capture and can't see, to sell new TVs. Uh, certainly, people want to sell new TVs with 4K. As I hope I pointed out, you can capture it, you can see it. Uh, it's not that big of a difference. But 4K, there was an improvement. No question that in the EBU tests, everyone thought 4K looked a little better than HD. Not a lot better, but a little better. Um, and why it's a little better is something that I've been mulling over. And part of it may be I pointed out that the Bayer sensors, the single sensors, have some issues. The lenses have some issues. So it may be that no one is yet capturing 4K the right way. And it might be interesting to compare what that Lockheed Martin camera at 4K might be in viewing tests, and maybe that would be even a little bit bigger, uh, better. But based on what people are doing today, certainly it's just a small improvement. Especially from the uh, capturing in 24 frames, it becomes more kind of Yeah. Um, if you capture in 24 frame, then... Uh, you have a longer exposure time, and so things that move get blurrier. So what cinematographers will typically do, and you know, my blessings to cinematographers, they know they've been working on this for 100 years. They've figured out what the limitations of their medium are, and so they know what to do. So one of the things that they'll do is use a smaller shutter angle, which is like going to a faster shutter speed uh, to get faster exposure so you get less blurriness. Now, there's an issue with that. When you do that, you tend to get an, an artifact called motion judder, a kind of strobing in the image. So one of the nice things I pointed out, you might not have noticed on the slide about brightness, that movie theaters are actually even darker um, than the monitors that people are using in the trucks for shading. And that darkness may actually be helpful in reducing that strobing because, again, there are those grayish lines and if you can't see those grayish lines, then you're seeing less motion artifacts. Um, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, uh, so on um, the smaller shutter angle, it seems to be the case for the people who've been looking into higher frame rate that when you get to a higher frame rate, like above 100 frames per second, that you can then go to an even shorter shutter and the judder becomes less visible. So we may be able to improve the dynamic uh, resolution even more without having to go to yet a higher frame rate, but need to get up to something over 100, 120, something like that. Yes, in the back there. Do you see a future for ultra high definition production on live sports and broadcasting? It's a very difficult question, and the people that it depends on are uh, people like Ingenue. Uh, Canon, Fujinon, uh, and Schneider, uh, and maybe Nikon and Zeiss also. Um, as I mentioned, Canon just introduced a 20 to 1 um, lens for an ultra high definition PL mount camera. Um, my understanding is it's a really wonderful lens. I haven't been able to put it through its paces yet, but I believe that it's probably a wonderful lens, but it's only 20 to 1. And you can shoot sports with that kind of lens, but it means that to go from the wide shot to the tight shot, you have to cut between two different cameras. You can't have one camera and the director says, okay, zoom in on the wide receiver or whatever. So until the lens manufacturers do something, that's gonna be a huge problem. But let me point out that it was very similar in HD. When I did my first HD show in 1989, 
the tightest HD lens that was available was a 12 to 1, which is all that was available for PL mount until Canon made their announcement. And now we have these 100 to 1 HD lenses. So it's possible to do, but it doesn't follow Moore's law. It's not silicon, it's <laughs> silicon oxide, which has uh, been turned into glass. Uh, yes, let me just point out that officially my time is up, so anyone who needs to go for anything, please do. But as I said, there's no one following us, so I'll stay here until all your questions are answered. Christy. Um, at HPA last year, there was a, a display, Dolby Labs put up uh, to sort of explore the question of nits a mm -hmm. lot more. And, and there was some, just got a lot of discussion about standardization of some of those kinds of issues. Is there... I know you've been to a couple of meetings since then. Is there movement towards one direction or the other? Yes, SIMTI has standardized the uh, perceptual quantizer that Dolby came up with for what they call Dolby Vision. It's their version of high dynamic range. So there has been some standardization. There are basically four organizations that are pushing high dynamic range, uh, Dolby, Philips, um, BBC, and Technicolor. Um, and they, they seem to be moving towards one system. So I think that is something that we're going to see soon. The next question is, how do you get that to the home? Um, so if you do an additional layer on it, are the consumer electronics manufacturers going to put in the small circuit that will allow the TV to decode the layer? But even just improving the reference monitor makes up a big difference. There was one Dolby demo that they did with two identical uh, Samsung TVs. I think they were about 900 nits. And one of them had the higher dynamic range color grading and the other one had normal color grading. And it looked like there was more detail in the picture because there was, because they were getting rid of clipping that was occurring in the low dynamic range one. Yes? This might be a tough question to answer, but if you had a, a certain budget now to spend on cameras, and that budget wouldn't be coming up again for another three or four years. Would you go with really nice looking HD cameras or 4K option? It doesn't seem quite perfect yet. Uh, I would go for HD cameras and I would actually try to live with my existing camera and get a better lens because the lens makes a huge difference. Any other questions? Okay, thank you all for coming. <laughs>